After a few years of casting instability, both Roger Moore and his 1973 debut Bond film Live and Let Die had proved there was life left in the old horse, which could mean Roger Moore or Bond or both. The studio and producers decided to strike while the iron was hot and quickly put out another Roger Moore Bond film the next year. The result is... Foo yuck. Oh, the man with the golden gun. The Man with the Golden Gun should have been an excellent movie. It was based on an excellent idea, had a good cast and exotic locations, but it turned out to be a bit of a duff film. An entertainingly duff film, but duff nonetheless. On the scale of duff, The Man with the Golden Gun ranks somewhere around the final season of the A-Team, that level duff. After both Live and Let Die and its star Roger Moore had proven to be successful, the studio wanted another film pronto, but they didn't have the rights to any film called Pronto, and instead settled for another Bond film, Quick Smart, despite Ian Fleming never having written any book called Quick Smart. Producers Harry Saltzman and Albert R. Broccoli accelerated plans for their next Bond film, putting The Man with the Golden Gun into production for a December 1974 release, a mere 18 months after the premiere of Live and Let Die. I'll tell you what, Sonny, I'll give you 20,000 baht if you can make this heap go any faster. 20,000 baht! I'm afraid I have to owe you! Bloody tourists! Bond has apparently been marked for death by famed assassin Scaramanga, known in spy circles as the Man with the Golden Gun. 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 Scaramanga is a crack shot, but don't go by what it says on Urban Dictionary. It just means he's good with a gun. <laughs> a harmless toy. Bond elects to hunt down Scaramanga before Scaramanga gets him, and the trail leads Bond to a private gunsmith in Macau. I'm now aiming precisely at your groin. So speak of forever hold your peace. From there he finds Andrea Anders, Scaramanga's girlfriend, that he only sleeps with before a job. It turns out Scaramanga is not actually after Bond, but a missing solar energy expert. Moving to Hong Kong with the assistance of Lieutenant Hip, Bond comes across Mary Goodnight. Okay, now that I say that out loud, I immediately regret my choice of words. Mary works for British intelligence in Hong Kong and has a history of being stood up by Bond. Awkward. I'll buy you dinner tonight, good night, but first I have a little official business to attend to. Yes, I saw the official business. Good night. Would I do that to you after two years? Yes, you bloody well would. Bond follows Scaramanga to Bangkok, stops the film for way too long for some kung fu action because that was popular with kids at the time, before another chase, this time in a dirty river where, hey look, it's Sheriff Shit Sandwich, J.W. Pepper. The story's other element, a missing solar energy doohickey that something 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 solar power, is in play before Scaramanga's got that as well. This leads Bond to Scaramanga's private island where he's got a deadly funhouse, which he uses to keep limber by luring unsuspecting killers to use his target practice with his famous golden gun. To us, Mr Bond, we are the best. Bond and Scaramanga face off over dinner. There's a useful four-letter word. And you're full of it. Before a duel to the death between the two. It sounds cool, but it's more tepid than cool. There are some great ideas in this film, but holistically it all feels a tad underbaked. Like eating semi-cooked chicken. You might not die from eating it, but you know, it's not good. Bond is almost gadget free in this, leaving Scaramanga to have all the cool toys. He has his fun house, a secluded island lair with fricking laser beams, a car that turns into an aeroplane, and of course, his famous golden gun, which is assembled from a cigarette case, lighter, pen, chewing gum, bits of old string and duct tape. The man with the golden gun. The man with the golden gun. Scaramanga may have been the man with the golden gun, but Roger Moore was the man with the golden guns. I'll take care of the maintenance man. I already did. I laid him out cold. You did? Yes. There's more to you than meets the eye, good night. Roger Moore, of all people, manages to keep his dignity throughout much of this film, apart from the bit where he has to shit out a bullet. Hotel, mister? No. The nearest pharmacy. You mean to say there is no way to trace that bullet? No idea what it went through to get here. Christopher Lee is clearly having fun playing a lighter role for a change. A difficult shot, but most gratifying. Compared to his usual Dracula, Frankenstein, that sort of thing. Scaramanga is probably the real hero of this film, despite what it says on the posters. Scaramanga is playful and ruthless at the same time, and gets more screen time than most Bond villains, and with good reason. He's just so cool. His servant, Knickknack, is played by Hervé Villachet several years before his most famous role as Tattoo on the TV series Fantasy Island. I bet it all. 
But you'll have to do better than that if you want to come into my money. I get you yet. And I'll enjoy you when you see you leave me. You'll be the death of me yet, Nick-Nack. Nick-Nack had the potential to be highly annoying, but it comes off as merely slightly annoying. Villachez does make a great contrast from the usual henchman in a Bond film. Who do you think sent that bullet to London with your number on it? I did. Maud Adams plays Andrea, the thankless role of gangster's girlfriend who dies halfway through the film. But years later, Adams was rewarded with the title role of a later Roger Moore film, Mrs. Moonraker. But that was cut in editing, and so she got Octopussy as a consolation prize. And you're full of it. Britt Eklund as Mary Goodnight is fairly ditzy when it comes to tradecraft, and not remotely competent. More Tiffany Case than Pussy Galore. You see what a two-year posting to staff intelligence does for a girl? James, it's wonderful to see you. Unlike her other memorable roles in the early 70s like Get Carter or The Wicker Man, she almost keeps her clothes on here. Almost. James, you must be good. Since Scaramanga has a superfluous third nipple, the script takes great delight in bringing it up again. A third nipple, sir. And again. Fascinating anatomical tidbit. And again. Oh, I admit it's a little kinky. So that Bond can impersonate Scaramanga purely by pretending to be a triple nipple. But then, you already knew this film was a load of tits. He must have found me quite titillating. In the 1970s, solar energy was little understood by the public, with it for most people being some form of mysterious magic where sunlight was turned into energy. Despite burning your ass on a car seat on a hot day having been a thing for decades, skip ahead 50 years, bugger all has changed. This video is made in a dwelling powered by solar panels, and judging by my goddamn electricity bills, we still have a way to go. Well, we all get our jollies one way or another. The Man with the Golden Gun has a sleazy sounding title song sung by Scottish singer Lulu. It sounds like it's played by a band on a daytime talk show. It's not terrible, it's just lacking that oomph you expect of a Bond song. John Barry seems like he's on autopilot here. Like the music, the film in general has a slight air of sleaze. Like a politician who's got your daughter's phone number. There's strip clubs, Miss Goodnight being forced to sit in a wardrobe and listen to Bond banging Andrea for a few hours. and double entendres out the wazoo. She's just coming, sir. It's almost a carry-on film, but with more laughs. <laughs> Director Guy Hamilton was back for his fourth and apparently final James Bond film, and it all feels a little played out here. You're not thinking that. I sure am, boy. Okay, the car doing a 360 roll while jumping a bridge looks cool. But it's got a goofy slide whistle sound effect on the soundtrack. And then they cut to shit sandwich J.W. Pepper in the car with Bond. After the semi-climactic battle with Scaramanga is over, the film takes a sweet time getting to the end. It's not Lord of the Rings level never-ending story, but still. Also, tangentially, just before Man with the Golden Gun was to begin principal photography, Moore's predecessor, Sean Connery, had moved as far away from Bond as he could, with his turn in the 1974 weirdo freako sci-fi film, The Zardoz. All the ingredients of a great Bond film are there. Girls, gadgets, and a great villain. And very little is outright bad. That's no problem. It's entertaining, but when you've finished it, it leaves you feeling a little hollow and unfulfilled. Like voting in a local election. Maybe the stakes feel too low. Maybe it's because the film had a relatively small number of speaking roles. And this guy. Surprise. Oh, a surprise. It's the least epic feeling Bond film of all of them. It's neither dirty and gritty like the most popular action films of the 70s, nor is it fantastical enough for a James Bond film. It's somewhere in the absolute middle. It almost feels like a TV movie rather than a feature. Having said that though, it's still a watchable and entertaining film. I approve. Do. Depending on who you ask, it may or may not be the worst Bond film of the decade, but it's definitely the one that most people would have a hard time remembering anything about it. Every long-running series has a disappointing but highly entertaining entry, a disposable thing you enjoyed enough at the time but don't hold it in high regard when you consider it later. It's basically the Bond equivalent of that season of The Dukes of Hazard without The Dukes of Hazard. Man with the Golden Gun didn't find the same level of success as most Bond films had. It wasn't a flop, just disappointing, and this time they just couldn't point and stare at George Lazenby. Cubby, mate, anytime you need me, I'm there, call me. It was also the last Bond film to be made with Harry Saltzman's name on the credits. The relationship between Saltzman and Broccoli had been strained for the past few films, and they would oversee alternate Bond films. 
The straw that broke the camel's back was Saltzman's outside business interests, which had caused him financial pain, and he was forced to sell his stake in the Bond series to United Artists. Good night. Where are the car keys? Broccoli, now in charge of the Bond films on his own, had to work out what went wrong and what could be done to salvage Bond, which would lead to Roger Moore's greatest James Bond adventure. Subscribe, like and subscribe. Also leave a comment and watch some more vids. Thank <laughs> you.